Uh, we're excited to have you here at Identity Church this morning. Um, we got a lot going on coming up, and so you're going to see some of the slides behind me. Uh, women's Bible study tomorrow night uh, at Doris's house at 6.30. If you don't know where that's at, find her. She'll tell you. Um, and next week we'll be at our house. So tomorrow night, um, oh, no, we changed it up again. Okay, nobody tells me anything around here. So um, all I know is tomorrow night is at Doris's house. Um, and we'll tell you next week what, what the next one is and, and where at, all right? Um, we have Unchurch coming up this Saturday, which is down at Stag, um, just a block uh, east of here. I always get turned around once I get in the building. Um, Stag is a local whiskey and cigar lounge that uh, we do a Bible study at noon every other Saturday there. Uh, and what we like about that Bible study is um, we just get together in a place that's neutral where uh, most people who aren't willing to come to church are willing to go to a bar, and so we love to go sit there and have conversations about Jesus. And so uh, we've been working through the uh, parables of Jesus, uh, and they've been going great. I think we're almost done with all the, I mean, we have gone through almost all the parables of Jesus, uh, and so we may be switching that up a little bit here pretty soon, but this Saturday is our stag uh, unchurch, and so be there for that. Also, Wednesday nights, we do our Bible study. That You won't see a slide up here. Um, but Wednesday nights, we do our Bible study at Omerta uh, Cigar Lounge on the south side uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, very similar format to what we do at, at Unchurch. Um, just a little bit different topic there. We still talk about Jesus, uh, and we still are open to anybody being there for that. And so feel free to come to either one of those. Um, also, you can scan the QR code behind me, uh, and that will take you to our connection page on our, our uh, website. You can also fill out a card in the back and drop it in one of the black boxes, and that way we will have information on you, and you can have our information, and feel free to give as little or as much of that information as you want, uh, and we will be able to uh, stay in contact with you about the things coming up. Uh, we also, on our website, have two spots uh, on our main page where you can click and give. You can donate to the church to help us out and to help us continue the mission of what we're doing, but you can also text the amount you want to give to 84321. Uh, it'll give you kind of a three prompt deal that you've got to go through to make that happen. Uh, it's a wonderful way to give. If you want to give the old school way, we've got boxes in the back that you can put cash or checks in uh, back there as well. Um, we also have our, our t-shirt page. Uh, you can buy shirts like this beautiful one that I'm modeling today. Um, here's the deal. The, the money that those sell for, all the profit goes right back into the mission of the church. And so just a way that you can support us, but also when you're out and about in town, you can pick up stickers or notebooks or t-shirts or any of those types of things and uh, let people see who we are as a church. Um, we also have overtime uh, afterward, a time for us to discuss and, and work through what we teach today during the sermon. We'll, t sermon. we'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, afterward. Let's uh, go ahead and stand. I'm going to lead us in prayer and then hand it over to the praise team. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for such a beautiful morning that we get to come uh, into your presence and worship you. God, this morning as, as we continue to dig into the idea of what church is, we just pray uh, that our minds will be clear uh, and that your scripture will come to life in Christ's name. Amen.
34 through 12. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a long time. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me, Lord. Be my help. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth. You clothe me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold. Like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. Mercy for today, faithful you have been, faithful you will be. Pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my
See your heart, everything made 
Father, we're just so thankful to be in this place to praise you as we sing these, this last song, So Will I, a hundred billion times, we praise you, we love you. We're thankful that you love us back. We, me, we the church, me as a Christian, so will I. In Christ's name, amen. You may amen. be seated. Thank you, guys. Uh, we live in a very interesting season in the history of the world. We don't really know it because nothing's changed that much. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's changed in our lives, uh, especially the older I get, the more I realize the way the world was when I was a kid uh, is not the way the world is right now. Um, I mean, I can't afford eggs anymore, right? Um, but 
we live in a really interesting season in humanity. I, I, let me put it that way. What's really interesting about it, um, and, and it, and it may be a very American thing, or at least something that we in America have have um, um, made a, a virtue uh, of the American way. Um, but for one of the very first real times in the world, we we have begun to prize individuality over community. <clears throat> it's a it's a very weird thing, um, and some of that I think is is because of how prosperous we've been. Um, I, I think if you look back over the the centuries and you look at a whole bunch of different societies, um, you, you had to depend on everybody. I mean, you know, a, a, a tribe of people living, you know, in, in the, the wilderness or whatever. I mean, they would have to depend on everybody to do their job for everybody to survive. Um, when when you look at the the colonies that started in America, I mean, if one person didn't carry their weight, it was it was damaging to the whole community. I, it, it, you look back over history, and very rarely, you might be able to pull out one or two uh, examples, but very rarely uh, were humans ever able to live on their own. And, and I recognize as I'm saying this, as, as a parent of a 20-year-old and a 17-year-old that are uh, hanging out out there at the moment, I think, um, and I hope my 20-year-old isn't listening. Normally, I want him to listen on a sermon, but right now, I hope he's not. Um, as, as a parent, I, 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 we're at that point where we, we want to pride ourselves in our kids being able to get out and live on their own. And that's a good thing. That's a very healthy thing, right? We raise them to be able to function on their own. We raise them to be able to, to make a living. We raise them and, and, and hope the best for them. But I think we're one of the first generations ever to prize individualism. That doesn't mean that, that generations before us didn't have individual personalities and all that type of stuff. But there is something in our world now that makes us feel like living in community is something wrong. Living in community is something that, that is, is to be frowned on. I'm not good enough to function on my own. I'm not good enough to pay my own bills. I'm not good enough to, to meet my family's need. I need others around me, a community around me. And there's something about that mentality in America today that, that's become very um, deeply ingrained in, in the way we live. And hear me on this. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying we're the first ones to really focus on that. I, I think there's value in saying that, that I worked hard enough to provide this for myself. But we might be the first generation that, or first people group, not generation, it's been going on for a while. But we might, as Americans, modern day Americans, be the first people group that says, I earned all that for myself and I'm not going to share or help my community with that. Here's where it gets very interesting. I mean, we could look at that from the political or the social side of it and say, okay, well, that's, that's maybe a liberal way of thinking or, or one of my favorites that, that um, I, I've grown up with that, that I've always often laughed at, laughed at is when uh, you see in a movie or you see in, a, in uh, someone trying to explain how the disciples lived and, and the interrelations between the disciples and Jesus and, and the different people, and you look at it and you go, that's kind of like the hippies in the 70s, right? You know, it's kind of this, this communal living, and, and we'd like to throw that out there as something that, that um, dismisses the communal side of it. And, and putting all that together in, in modern-day America, I think if we focus on one or the other, we miss out on something really important. Here, here's what happens. We, we look at Scripture, and we look at stories in the Old Testament, and we like to pick out people like Samson. We like to pick out people like David. We like to pick out heroes like Moses. And, and we look at him, and we go, see that man, Samson, you know, what he did was, was amazing, and he did it all by himself. Um, you see David, and he, he slaughtered you know, Goliath. He did that all by himself. And you see Moses, he led the Israelites out of Egypt all by himself. You know, and, and it's this, this individual interpretation of that. But when we really start to dig into it, we, we, we start to realize the communal side of it. Let me give you an example. My favorite Old Testament person is Daniel. 
Um, I, I just love the book of Daniel. I love the story of Daniel. I love how Daniel, how, how that whole story progresses, where the Israelites go into captivity because of their unfaithfulness. And, and Daniel's this lone guy. He's this, this lone ranger. He's this lone faithful person. He, yeah, we, we hear mention of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the story's really about Daniel. Daniel is the guy. He's the one who's the hero of the story, right? I mean, he, he finds himself in the lion's den all by himself. So clearly it's an individual story, right? And, and yes, there is this beautiful um, uh, a narrative of Daniel's faith when nobody else is standing firm. There's this beautiful narrative of Daniel's faith when, when death is on the line. And yes, that is something that as an individual, he has to stand up and proclaim. But there's a text we miss. When we end the story of Daniel in the lion's den in chapter 6, we, we miss something really important in the story of Daniel. And I want you to see this. If you go to Daniel chapter 9, Jesus, or Daniel has this prayer. And, and it's this really interesting prayer. Because let me, let me tell you just before we read it, if I was Daniel, <laughs> probably this is why I'm not Daniel. If I was Daniel and let's say all of America was taken into captivity because we've, we've, we've fallen away from the Lord and, and we've, we've walked away from him. So we're all taken into captivity and I'm the last standing believer in Jesus Christ. And, and I've, you know, stood up to the king, and, and I've proven my faith over and over again. I've been thrown in the lion's den, and, and God shut the mouths of the lions, and, and I you know, came out of that unscathed and, 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 you know, put into these positions of authority. I'm going to have an awfully big head about it. I'm going to be like, look at me. I'm the only one faithful. You suckers, you guys are the ones who fell away. But, and, and my prayers would be that way. My prayers would have so much arrogance in them. Daniel's prayer here, though, in chapter 9 is really interesting. I think we start in verse 4. It says this, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Well, Daniel's confessing. Now, I want you to hear this. Maybe something I should have said starting out. When we look at Samson, Samson has his sins all drug out in front of everybody. He, he's a womanizer. He's got a temper, all that stuff. David, uh, murderer, adulterer, liar, you know, all that. Uh, you know, you, you got Moses who was a murderer as well. And, and, you know, you've got all of their sins drug out. We don't see any of Daniel's sins drug out. Not that he was sinless, but there's none of his sins being drug out in front of the community and put in, text, in the text for us. But he says, I prayed to the Lord, my God, and confessed. Now, what is Daniel going to confess? He says, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all, uh, with love, um, with all who love him and obey his commands. Verse 5, hear this. We, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, and spoke, uh, um, who spoke in your name to our kings, our, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Um, I think we go on to eight, don't we? Yeah. Um, Lord, your righteousness, but this day, or you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far in all the co countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you, O oh Lord. We and our kings, our, our princes and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. Do you see what's happening with Daniel? Of course Daniel sinned, but Daniel is the hero. Daniel is the one in this book that stands out above everybody else's being faithful. Daniel's the one, when the decree comes out, you will not pray. He got down and prayed publicly three times a day. Daniel's the one, when he was told to worship the king as God, he said, I can't. Daniel's the one who has been faithful, yet when it comes time for this prayer of his to be recorded in Scripture, it's not they were unfaithful. It's not they were sinners. It's not they lied, they cheated, they did this, they did that, they turned their back. No. Daniel understands something that we don't. Is that community is more important than individuality. I want you to hear that. Community doesn't 
undermine individuality. Community doesn't do away with individuality. Nobody's saying that community requires you to be perfectly uniform and everybody look alike, act alike, think alike, talk alike, all that. No. But community, Daniel sees that community is more important than his individual identity. And so instead of praying, we're in this situation, we're in this pickle, we're in this bad place because you guys did this, and so I'm praying the Lord that he'll forgive you, he says we. Because he's part of the community that did it. He, he may have participated at some point. I, I mean, he's a human being. He, he sinned at some point. But he says we. We were unfaithful. We, 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 we. Church, here's, here's what I think where we've made the big mistake, where this has come undone. We've missed the point that we are a community. That when we are doing this, it's not just we come together for an hour on Sunday morning and everybody goes home and goes their own ways, and it doesn't matter what you do or it doesn't matter what I do. We, we're just going to go out and be who we want to be and do the things we want to do. And, and, but when God looks at the church, not just Identity Church, but when God looks at the church as a whole, it is not I, it is we. Here's where I think we've made the mistake. For the last, I don't know, 50 years, 60 years. The church has pushed this idea, and please don't hang me until I get this statement out of my mouth. The church has pushed this idea that when we accept Jesus Christ, we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior. Here's the problem I have with that. It's not that Jesus isn't personal. It's not that Jesus doesn't know us as individuals. It's not that Jesus doesn't interact with us as individuals and, and our salvation doesn't come. As, I mean, it does come as individuals. Jesus does act with us in those ways. Jesus is a personal Savior to me, but that's not the whole story. Jesus, Scripture says time and time again, died for the church. Jesus died so that all may be saved. And when we take this idea of accepting Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we, we understand a really important biblical truth that I as an individual, if I was the only person left on the planet, that God would care enough about me that he would send Jesus Christ to die for me. That is a biblical truth, that God w would, would send his son to the cross just for one person to accept his grace. That is the truth of having a personal Savior. The fallacy of it and, and a fallacy of neglect is that it misses the, th the truth that the church, the body of believers, those who are living in community for the singular purpose of serving Jesus Christ and taking his gospel into the world, is left out of that statement. And we get this idea that I can be the hero. I can do it on my own. I've been hurt in the church. Don't ask me to go back. I, 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 there's a bunch of hypocrites in church. Really? Yeah, there are. It's a place of sinners. There's, there's, you know, you don't understand what goes on in the church. I went to, okay, find another church. But we were created to live in community with each other. And on top of that, on top of that, the church was designed, not just humans being created to live in community, but the church was designed that it excels and, and does its best when there is true community in the church. I, I think this is why our Bible studies and cigar lounges have, have been so successful. Because you walk into a cigar lounge, whether, whether you like the idea of being in a cigar lounge or not, it's, that's, we can talk about that during overtime. But there is this communal nature in a cigar lounge. And when you inject the Holy Spirit and you inject the gospel in it, it it's such a natural place to receive it because the, the mode of the church already exists in those places. This idea of community and living together and, 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 and being one is already there. You just got to put the purpose in it. There's this text that I absolutely love in the New Testament. It's in First uh, uh, Corinthians, I almost said Chronicles, because my mind was still in the Old Testament. In, in First Corinthians, in chapter 12, it's probably a passage you've heard a hundred times, but I want you to hear it a little bit different today. Chapter 12, verse 12, 
says the body is a unit. This is talking about the church. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all the parts are many, they form one body, for it is with Christ, so it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, one, and, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? In fact, uh, But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be as it is? There are many parts, but one body. I've heard this preached. I've preached this many times about, well, what are your gifts in the church? What are your individual gifts? What can you do? I can't get up here and sing. Praise God y'all don't have me on your praise team. I mean, I'd, 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 there, there's, this is a small enough room that if I'm standing in the back singing at full volume like I like to sometimes, I get side-eyed from every single person on stage singing. They're like, seriously, dude, we can't sing with you doing what you're doing back there. My gift is not singing. Um, and I, I've preached this text, and I've taught this text. I said, well, what, what's your gift? What's your individual thing that God has created you to be, to be a part of the body? And, and I've put the emphasis on what you have. I think it's time we flip that emphasis. The emphasis needs to be on the body. Because here's the deal. I, I know this. I, I, I've, I still have all my fingers left and all my toes, thank God. Um, I, I have a friend um, who does not have all of his fingers and toes left. Um, I, I have one friend who lost three toes because he ran over his foot with a lawnmower. Um, I have one friend who lost his, most of his, his, I think it's his, his pointer finger. It was his pointer finger in a circular saw accident. Um, and his father actually lost his finger the same way. I don't know. Um, but here's what I do know. A body can exist without its individual things. The church can exist without a few of its individuals. The church is greater than the individual. But, hear me on this, the church is at its most healthy place when all the individuals are healthy. And all the individuals are leaning into and living into how God created them as individuals and is interacting with them as individuals and connecting with them and letting them grow and having this personal relationship with them as individuals. But hear me on this. My hand, no matter what the Adams family says, my hand cannot live without a body. Period. And when the Bible says... That God created it this way. He assigned us our place. He is giving us individuality. He's given us individual character. He's given us individual tasks. He's given us individual talents. He's given us individual personality, but that belongs to a body. So here's why this matters as a church. If we look at the story of Daniel, we look at all the other heroes of the Old Testament. If we want to single one person out, guys like the worship leader or the preacher or somebody else get all the attention, and they become the ones who become the personality of the church or the one focal point of the church. But here's the deal. Each and every one of you as individuals, uh, individuals is vitally important as part of the whole of the church because the church needs you to function in a healthy way. For the church to be healthy, we need you to be a part of the church. But for you to be alive in Christ, you were designed to live and work and thrive in community. You cannot spiritually live in a healthy way without the body. You see, the we is more important than the me. The we is greater than than me, it doesn't mean that the me, I, it doesn't mean that I'm not worth anything. But because of the community, the individual has value. The individual is given 
its value because that's how God created us. And so here's my encouragement. I want to wrap it up. Here's my encouragement for you today. As you are contemplating what the church is, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. We're, we're leaning into defining what church is and defining who we are and, and understanding better uh, what God has called us to be as a church. I, I want you to consider a few things. I want you to consider how do you live your life as an individual or as a part of a group, as an individual or as a part of a community. Um, and, and, and hear me on this. I know that some of us who are, who are introverted are going, oh, I don't like this sermon. I'm not asking you to, to not be introverted or not be an individual. What I'm just saying is if you want to be really healthy and you want to function the way that God has called you to function, the church needs you to be a part of the community. And so evaluate. Look back into your life and say, okay, have I been willing to be a part of a community? And, and we can talk a little bit in overtime what that means to being an authentic part of a community and, and the, the vulnerability that sh- has and, and, and the vulnerability that we have to share with each other, uh, but also the benefits. But I want you just to consider, what would it look like if God's church in America lived in true community with one mission and one goal that all the individuals were functioning in their own way to make that community advance that one goal of letting the world know who Jesus Christ is. What would that look like? Let me pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this look into what the church is. Forgive us when we've made it an individual thing. Forgive us when we've pretended like our salvation was just about us. God, I pray that today as we just contemplate this idea as we process it, God. I just pray that you'll help us see that we need community. We need people around us um, of like mission, like-minded, uh, moving in the same direction, and that's to glorify you and, and bring the world into a knowledge and love and grace of Jesus Christ. Um, God, we love you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Um, during these next two songs, you're going to have a wonderful opportunity. Um, one of the things that I love about talking about community is we get to go right into a thing called communion. And what communion is is this beautiful act that we do on a, uh, we, we offer it on a weekly basis. I know some of you probably aren't used to that, um, but we offer it. And, and so if you would like to take it today, we would love for you to do that. But what communi- uh, communion is, is it's a, a declaration of a union between us and our Savior, Jesus uh, when, when he was eating with his disciples on the last night, the night before he was arrested, we call it the, the Last Supper, um, he took the bread and the wine and he said, when you eat of this bread, remember my body that's broken for you. And he s- took the wine, he drank, he said, remember uh, when you drink this, remember my blood that's shed for you. And, and he, he says, these are just two emblems that I'm establishing that when you partake in these, remember the sacrifice that I've made. And it's this union between us and him in that way. But what's cool is he didn't just pull the disciples aside and say, hey, Luke, let's, let's do this. Hey, hey, Matthew, let's do this. Hey, Philip, let's do this. He did it with them as a group, as, as a group of, of 12 of them at the time. Judas is about to, to bail out. But, but with 12 of them, they're all doing this together. It's a very community-oriented thing. And so as we're playing these next two songs, if, if you'd like to take communion and, and join in community that way, it's on the back table. There's also one of my favorite things about community is, is prayer. Um, we can lift each other up in prayer and, and help each other through the difficult times in life. There's already a couple prayer requests on the board back there, but there's cards in front of that, that uh, blackboard and with the, um, uh, um, what do you call that stuff? bulletin board stuff yeah whatever um, cork board whatever um, uh, you can fill out a uh, prayer request put it up there pin it up there we'll pray for it during this week we have a huge community of people that will see that and and pray for that i'll also be at the back if you need prayer but as we're singing these next two songs do one of those things
Definitely, definitely. Um, thank you guys for coming to Identity Church today. If you parked in the parking garage, remember it is free parking. Don't pay the $17 that they charge. Nothing against the loft. They're wonderful people. Um, also, we have our overtime discussion, uh, which is an opportunity for you to ask questions based on what we talked about today or even just questions in general about the church. And so we start that in about five minutes. So let me close in prayer. Uh, and you'll have five minutes to go to the bathroom, do whatever. Come back and we'll have our 12-minute discussion during overtime. God, thank Thank you today for giving us a body of believers that we can be a community with. God, forgive us when we've tried to be too individual, too uh, separated. Uh, and God, we, we recognize that that just does nothing but hurt us. God, today, um, as we uh, discuss this deeper, um, help us process this and understand it in a new way. In Christ's name, amen.